Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Nettleman. I'm a Texas RPLS and geomatics professor. And I put together this great video to talk about some of the basic skills, the most knowledgeable, the must-have skills for passing your Texas RPLS exam. Here, we're going to review the top three skills that every person should know before they jump in to their RPLS exam for the first try or if you're coming back for a repeat for subsequent tries as well. First of all, we've got our categories. And what's nice is the Texas Board publishes a legal and an analytical categories blueprint. And this is going to tell you, supposedly, what skills or what knowledge you have to have before passing this exam. But take a look. There is a ton of skills, definitions, and knowledge you must know. And these get kind of confusing because if you read a lot of the definitions, you're going to notice that they overlap, they sort of say the same thing, duplicitous. So even though we have this legal and analytical blueprint for the full exam and then combined blueprint for the reciprocal, it's really not that helpful, which is sort of weird. So let's go ahead and I'll let you read this stuff on your own. You definitely should read it. And let's jump in and let's discuss the top three skills you have to have to pass this exam. When I talk about the different knowledge areas of the RPLS, I think of things like boundary law, legal principles, history of Texas, Texas specific land units, all this stuff. But in this video, let's really focus on legal principles. Because if you look in the Texas board rules and regulations, they give you the top five legal principles you always have to know. And that is respect junior senior rights. But let me add some to that. Respect junior senior rights when it's applicable. If you're in a subdivision, you also need to know about sequential rights. Two. Follow in the footsteps of the surveyor. Original surveyors create, retracement surveyors follow. Three, follow the documented land title records. If you get a deed or a description or an easement that you don't like, that doesn't make much sense, that conflicts with your client's purpose, you can't ignore that document you have to follow all legal principles. Fourth, follow the intent of the boundary location as evidenced by the record. That means you don't follow the intent of the person who hired you. You follow the intent of the deeds, the easements, and the legal descriptions, and the surveys. And then fourth, respect the priority of calls, and that is basically your hierarchy of evidence. So all of this is important, but what I want to focus on today is going to be three things. Sequential conveyances, simultaneous conveyances, and priority of calls. You will get questions about this stuff in the legal. You will also have to use this, and if you don't know this stuff, you will have absolutely no chance of passing the analytical. So let's do a, a real deep dive and let's go through these subjects. Now, if you'd like a really in-depth discussion, we spend about 30 minutes per subject on each of these three in the RPLS bundle. But let me give you a brief preview of what we talk about and let's go through and talk about sequential conveyances, simultaneous conveyances, and priority of calls. First of all, sequential conveyances. This is a timeline of four scenarios. So it's one piece of land, and that piece of land is going to be divided between Mr. Green, Mr. Brown, Mr. Black, and then others coming up. Here we begin with the land being owned by Mr. Green. Then we have Mr. Brown purchasing a west slice of property. Next, 
Mr. Black buys in, and Mr. Black buys the centerpiece. And finally, we've got Mr. Blue, who buys the remaining chunk from Mr. Green. Now, first of all, let me ask you, how do you decide if there's an overlap between Mr. Green and Mr. Brown, who gets it? It's supposed to be a 400-foot parcel, and Mr. Brown buys in the west 150 feet. So we've got 250 for green, 150 for brown. What happens if actually the parcel is not 400 feet? What happens if it's only 390? Who is going to lose that 10 foot sliver when we figure out this parcel is not exactly 400 feet? So we're going to apply the first in time, first in right doctrine. And the first in time, first in right doctrine says that if Mr. Green came before Mr. Brown, then Mr. Brown is going to lose the 10 feet. First in time, first in right. Now that would work if it was a conflict between brown and black, or between black and blue. But let me give you a scenario where it doesn't work. So Mr. Green owned the entire parcel and then Mr. Brown bought in. Well, what happens when Mr. Green, the original property owner, decides he wants that 10 foot? Here is an exception. In the sequential conveyances scenario, the owner of the property who sold to blue, black, and brown doesn't get that first in time, first in right privilege. Why? Because he sold the land to these people. So first in time, first in right. Mr. Brown buys in 2000, Mr. Black buys in 2005. Who is senior? Brown. First in time, first in right. Mr. Black buys in 2005, Mr. Blue buys in 2000. Who gets senior? If there's a conflict, there's an overlap. It's going to be Black, because Black bought five years before Brown. But if there's ever a conflict between the original parent parcel owner and a sliver, the person who buys is going to win. It's kind of funky. But that is a huge tested item because first in time, first in right doesn't apply. Next, we have simultaneous conveyances. A simultaneous conveyance is when we have one plat, and that plat creates hundreds or thousands of lots at the same time. So we've got lots, roads, parks, utilities, all the stuff in the plat is created when that survey plat is recorded. So our first in time, first in right doctrine won't work because all the lots were created at the exact same time. So how do we figure out exactly where are these lots inside of a single block? Well, we're going to have to figure out how big is the block. Let's imagine it's a thousand feet by 240 feet. Then, if we cannot find those individual monuments within the block, as designated by the green points, we will have to reestablish those based on math. And the math is easy. What is the original dimension in the record? What is the retrace dimension? That's a ratio. And then we subdivide that which is discussed in our RPLS course. But let me give you three scenarios what you don't want to do. This is what the RPLS test makers set you up and they want you to get tricked. Scenario one, we have a thousand foot line. There's a 200 foot road and an 800 foot series of lots. Do not prorate the road. If the road says 50 feet on the plat, that road will always be 50 feet. Number two, 
Imagine there is a bunch of blocks, block one, two, three, four, five, six. You can prorate around one of the blocks, but never take the measurements from one block and apply it to another block. Never go outside the block. And finally, don't go outside the subdivision. You can't prorate between different parent parcels. So if you're in Shady Pines subdivision, don't go prorating all the way through Cypress Shores. Don't prorate roads, don't prorate across blocks, and don't prorate across subdivisions. Last but not least, we've got the priority of calls. And the priority of calls is an evidence conflict. We've got natural monuments, artificial monuments, bearing, distance, and area. A legal description says, beginning at the northwest corner of the parcel, go 100 feet to an iron rebar. Fast forward 10 years, you find the northwest corner of the parcel and you find the iron rebar, but the actual measurement is 102 feet. Do you hold the rebar or do you hold the distance? Your choice. Well, based on the priority of calls, artificial monuments like rebar have a higher dignity than distance. So your job is to hold the rebar and ignore the distance. Priority of calls is really part of your evidence collection and monument analysis. So you've got to know this hierarchy, natural monuments, artificial monuments, bearing, distance, and area. And if you can do that, you will be really well set up for the afternoon analytical. Well, that ends our lesson on the three most important things to know on the Texas RPLS exam. I highly encourage you to review all of the boundary principles before attacking this exam, but these three are so heavily tested on every exam. So I really encourage you to know these three subjects, consult your Browns or Clark on Boundaries textbook, enjoy the rest of the course, and know this stuff cold. Good luck, and I hope to see you in the full course soon.